Welcome to the Grace Story Podcast, where inspiring stories are brought to life. This podcast is made possible by Grace College and Seminary, located on the shores of Winona Lake in the great state of Indiana. I'm your host, Dr. Drew Flam. This is the Grace Story Podcast. Today I have with me Dr. Roger Stichter. He's got a bunch of letters after his name. He's been the professor of accounting for 21 years at Grace College in Winona Lake, Indiana. In 2013, he was awarded the Indiana Outstanding Educator Award by the Indiana CPA Society and the Alva J. McLean Excellence in Teaching Award from Grace College in 2018. Prior to coming to Grace, Stichter worked as a CPA, and he lives in Winona Lake, Indiana, with his wife of 35 years, Jane, and their seven children. Dr. Stichter, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, I'm excited to talk about your new book, The Principle of Maximums, which is one of those titles that you go, huh, that's that's kind of interesting. What exactly does that mean? So tell us a little bit about what, what the title means, what the book's about, and why you wrote it. Well, for probably 15 years, I've taught this kind of concept. And so the principles of maximums is I will set a maximum for my lifestyle and just different areas of life so that when I get that big break, when I start to make a lot more money than I ever dreamed of, it won't affect my lifestyle. And I will instead determine my lifestyle before I have a lot of money that drives me to buy things I don't really need and spend money on myself instead of kind of viewing money as it's all gods, because I believe it is all gods. And so once we view money as being all gods, then the big question is, how should I live in light of that instead of just, I just got a $100,000 bonus, I'm going to buy a new house, a bigger house, you know, and or I'm going to buy that luxury car I always wanted. Well, that's not even part of the conversation at that point because you've already decided you don't need that. And if God has allowed you to have that extra money, then how are you going to sow it into his kingdom? So the the maximums thing is coming to terms with I'm going to determine maximums in my life and set those hopefully for younger people before you actually have uh, money that drives you to buy things you don't need. So you you said you've been thinking about this for 15 mm-hmm. years. Um, and in the book throughout, you, you give a lot of personal testimony of how this has worked out in your own life. When did you start living by this principle? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because I, I think I, I probably really started living by it when I was about 27, 28 years mm-hmm. old. Uh, when I was in college, I had a professor by the name of Carl Kreider, and he was an economics guy, and he wrote a book. and And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, you go to a small college, and your professor writes a book, and you think that's pretty cool. So <laughs> I went to his book signing party, and I got one of his books. It was called The Christian Entrepreneur, and in that book, he he talked about a thing um, called the graduated tithe. Now, it wasn't his idea came from a man named Ron Sider, who also wrote a a book about how we're very rich and a lot of people are hungry, a lot of people are starving. So why instead of take money as we make more and more money and spend it on ourselves, why don't we start giving a higher percentage away so that in Sider's view, there's a point of income where you're giving 100% of everything else you make away. And so the graduated tithe stuck with me. And when I got my big break, so I was promoted, got a big promotion, um, got a raise that was more money than I ever anticipated making in my life. And my wife and I sat down and said, okay, now, how do we live because of this? Because we don't need this much money. And, And I'll admit, at that point in our lives, we still had student debt. We still had a mortgage. Um... We did not have nice, fancy cars. We had two children, not not seven. Um, and we talked about it. I applied numbers to the idea of, of a graduated tithe that Kreider had talked about, Cider had talked about. And we came up with kind of how much we wanted to keep and then 
we were giving a, a much higher percentage away than the tithe, which I think we'll talk about later, but uh, we were giving uh, about 20% of our gross income away, and then any bonuses we got, we were giving 50% of the gross amount away. And and this was at a time when we still had debt and we still were young and we had aspirations, I guess you could say, but we decided we were not going to live that way. And so I think that's where it really started for us. And the the concept, the idea of generosity matters more than stuff I can have in this world was something that we wanted to not only live out ourselves, but help our children understand. So going back to that question, I'd say probably when I was about 27, 28, um, is when we started thinking about it, and really by my early 30s, we were living that out. I think a lot of times we we have this idea of, oh, I'd love to give more away, or but we never put an action plan into place. And, and that's what you did, and that's what you talk about in the book is, okay, that, that's a great dream or aspiration. Now what's your action plan to actually put it into practice and, and to live it out? I want to go through some of the chapters and some of the things that stood out to me um, and certainly advise everyone to get the book. Um, I was able to read through it and uh, hope to dig into it even more. But I just want to highlight on a few things, a few questions I had. Um, In chapter three, you uh, give a personal testimony to how this principle um, lived out and what you felt was God's will. And, and it took even in a different career path. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way you decided to live allowed you to have some flexibility in deciding what you wanted to do with your life and your journey and your career. Tell us a little bit about some of those transitions. Sure. Um, there was a, a point in my life, and it was shortly after I got that big promotion and, and big break, where I just uh, sensed God saying, someday you're going to teach college. And, and I, had, I grew up on a farm. I mean, I'm a first generation college student. So the idea of teaching at a college level would have never crossed my mind. Um, But just sensed that God was taking me that direction at some point, and my wife agreed. And so we we did something pretty radical, I know, and that is we took money and we just started paying off any debt we had. And I think that was kind of God preparing me for the huge pay cut I was going to get when I actually went to education. But we, instead of um, spending it on things we could have had, and we could have lived a very, very good lifestyle. Um, I was getting $10,000 raises a year. In in today's dollars, that would be close to $20,000 raise Mm -hmm. a year and getting bonuses and things. And instead of us spending that money, we kept giving it away. So any bonus, we'd give 50% away. um, And the raises didn't affect our lifestyle. And we continued to contribute at the level we were. And then we took extra money and paid off debt so that we were going to be debt free very quickly. And, um, and when the, the opportunity came to come to Grace College, it was faster than I thought. So I, I was 34 years old. Opportunity came. I never expected it that quickly. Um, we were able to take that 70% pay cut to be able to come to Grace. And knowing that I that we couldn't live on the amount of money that my salary would be at that point. And, and let me just say, Grace pays better today, so it's, it's not that <laughs> – it, it's not quite the same in It'd only be like a 60% pay cut now or something um, I, like that. I don't you know. know. <laughs> I won't go there. But, um, but we were able to do that because we truly believed God wanted that for our lives, and we had gotten past the place where we could be bought. And I think that's a key. Um, Paul in Philippians talks about learning to be content. And, and I've thought about that for so long. If Paul, who is like our (laughs) amazing Christian person, you know, we think of him as being the super Christian guy, and he says, I had to learn that. Um, Why is it any different for us? We're going to have to learn to be content. And so that attitude of learning and how, how Christ gives us strength to be content, which is what Paul says, 
right after he said, I learned to be content, and I can do that through Christ who gives me strength. Well, if Paul can learn to be content, I can learn to be content. And so instead of chasing after more and more stuff that I could buy, I will chase after sowing into God's kingdom, which is what Paul's talking about, this church who gave sacrificially, even when they probably didn't have much to give, they gave anyway. And Paul said, this is like increasing an account in your name that God keeps. And I, I believe somehow that account is paid back. I actually don't know how, but somehow it is. And so when we can decide we're just going to be content with having enough, and we take the extra God allows us to have and sow it into needs in, in this world of people who are poor or supporting missionaries, I think, and definitely supporting our local church where we're fed and we get benefit from. I think God takes that and puts it in some kind of an account that will be paid back someday. Hmm. So I, we don't really know what that is. I can't find in Scripture what that really is, but... Um, I believe if God keeps an account, he's faithful to pay it back. One of the things you do throughout the book is weave scripture and and give a biblical basis for the principles and for the application. Um, And in chapter four, you uh, answer the age-old question, what is the tithe? That question we ask all the time. Uh, One of the things you state is, I believe the tithe is still valid, sort of. Yep. So uh, explain to us, what is the tithe? Yeah, so the tithe actually goes back before the law. I mean, it was something that Abraham, the law didn't come until after the children of Israel left Egypt. So the, Abraham was there before the law. And and so back, even when he was Abram, um, he gave a tenth. And that tenth was to the priest of God most high, which we don't know anything else about it, him really. Um, except that Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And that principle seems to go on even to to Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, where God says, test me in this. I mean, God doesn't say test me um, hardly anywhere else except there, and said, if you will bring the full tithe in, which could have been as high as 30%, um, certainly was more than 10%, but could have been much higher, that God would take care of you. And that's what we've experienced in our lives, that God has taken care of us. So when I went back, when I went to Grace College the first time, took that massive pay cut, knew we couldn't live on the amount of money that, we, that I was making just from my teaching salary, um, God always supplied. He, he made opportunities for me to make more money. He all, we always had enough. And in the midst of that, we had to cut back our giving. I mean, we couldn't give 20% anymore but we still kept giving 10%, and God always took care of us. So why the sort of do I believe that? Um, I believe that everyone should tithe, and I know that's controversial, but I do believe that. I think it's a place, an area of trust, of faith, and that God will take care of you. Um, But as I look at the New Testament, I see how Jesus addressed parts of the Old Testament where it was said, you know, do this and don't do that. And then Jesus kind of adds to it. He says, the Old Testament said, I mean, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, man, it's more than that. If you just look at somebody the wrong way lustfully, if your heart is wrong, then that's still sinning. And so Jesus never took things in the Old Testament and downplayed them. He always kind of increased that. So here we are in a culture that is extremely wealthy, not like the culture Jesus was in, which was much poorer culture, more of a survival kind of thing, and they were asked to tithe. Why would Jesus come into our culture and say, well, you know what, you're you're making more money than probably anybody in the world overall has ever made, and so you can give less. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't make sense. I think that probably Jesus would expect more. Well, I'm convinced Jesus would expect more (laughs) out of us than just the tithe. And um, as I kind of show when I put numbers to this, if if Christian people who on average give about 3% of their income, if that would just go to just 10%, 
um, not even more, as I suggest probably would be expected of us. Um, if it just goes at 10 percent, that's like 35 to Ron Sider said more like 45 billion dollars a wow. year that is given. And, and that, as I show, that $35 billion would support 128,000 more missionaries um, just every year. And that's at a very high level of support. That's at a over $100,000 level of support, which how quickly could we reach the world for Christ if that would happen? And yet, in our society, we don't give, not even 10%. Very few people do. A small percentage of Christians do. And um, I, I just struggle to believe that that God is really pleased with that. Um, I think there's more that should be expected. And Jesus always talks about our hearts too, right? You know, it's not just uh, a do's and don'ts thing. It's it's what's going on in your heart. Um, and, and you talk about that in the book too, generosity of the heart. Um, in chapters five through eight, you go through many of the areas where principle of the maximums can be applied, housing, debt, clothes, food, transportation. What do you see as some of the biggest hurdles for folks in actually living by the principle of the maximums? Yeah, it's lack of contentment. I think that's probably the biggest hurdle, especially for the big ticket items. So for houses and cars, let's just take those two um, because they're they're very can be very expensive items. And we look at how other people are living. We even look at how other people in our church are are living, and and we think I. I deserve that, um, or I am owed that in some way. Um, and actually, there was a chapel speaker here at Grace at one point a long time ago who spoke kind of to that issue, saying that when we have this mentality that God gives us bigger houses, nicer, more expensive cars, things like that, we're kind of saying that God loves us more than he loves the people who can't ever afford that. I mean, if God gives us that, God loves us more, which I don't believe. I don't think anybody believes. So the question then starts to become, how do I steward God's money so that I spend an appropriate amount on myself instead of spending money that could be used to further his kingdom? Hmm. Um, so that's that one. Uh, so contentment, you know, big thing is contentment. I think the other area probably is just lack of knowledge. Uh, I, I say in the book, I show in the book how if you eat out lunch every day and spend about ten dollars, um, just average, that's going to be around twenty five hundred dollars a year. And so if you work for forty years, twenty five hundred dollars a year, there's a hundred thousand dollars you have spent. Wow. in a lifetime, just eating lunch out. And so if you could just cut that in half and spend half that much, you'd have $50,000 more to give, and, and you wouldn't, wouldn't really ever um, lose it because you're eating that money, <laughs> in essence, at, for lunch anyway. Um, so you'd have 50000 more. And the interesting thing about that is if you take – someone who makes $50,000 a year on average throughout their lifetime and gives 3%, that's $1,500 a year, you can, only eating out half as much, donate twice as much money over your lifetime than what you're donating. Mm -hmm. And I've rounded that a little bit of what you're donating if you're giving 3% on a $50,000 salary. So just that thing of being mindful of eating out um, I talk about specialty drinks, and I know that steps on some toes. People like their Starbucks and, and things, but specialty drinks and how much money that can generate, which, again, can come out close to $40,000 over a lifetime if you're used to buying specialty drinks every day. And, and so just that knowledge of how much you're going to spend in a lifetime for those things, I think, is something people just don't realize. I once uh, took my lunch that I bring to work, and, and this was probably probably seven, eight years ago, and actually like went through the cost of my apple and each of my carrot sticks and my piece of bread and down to my mustard. <laughs> it came down to like, it was like $3 and 40 some odd cents um, that it would cost me, you know, to pack my lunch all in, like baggies, everything, <laughs> compared to, like you said, $10, which is for sure on the 
on the low side of what you would spend to to go out to for lunch. a nice lunch anyway. Yes, it's exactly, going to be a lot more exactly. Right? Um, so I have to touch on chapter eleven because this is just phenomenal. Kind of blew me away when I was reading it about inheritance and education. Um, and I had one of those kind of aha moments reading that. Like, yes, that's kind of what I've always thought, but somebody actually put good words to it. So tell us about sort of chapter 11 and your thoughts on inheritance and education. Yeah, I, I sort of had an aha moment too when I uh, really started thinking about that chapter. There was just something that stirred in me for years and years about inheritance and how in our society we're 80 some years old and we give a lot of money to our 60 year old children. And, and it seems like, what's the point? I mean, yeah. If, if someone who's 60 years old needs that money, then one of two things I believe has happened. One is potentially a disaster in their life, and, and that can happen, and that's maybe a good reason to help them out um, when you die and give them some money. Or, as I also say, you know, maybe they spent their life in ministry as a missionary, weren't supported really well and have nothing to fall back on. And so that's another reason maybe to leave a little bit more money. But the other one is if they're 60 years old and have no money and are in a lot of debt, they've wasted all the opportunity they had themselves. So why would I give them a lot of money so they can waste the money that I saved and was frugal and kept? It doesn't make any sense. So as I tried to think through more what the purpose of inheritance was, I came to this concept that I believe inheritance had had the necessity of passing on to the next generation the ability to earn an income. So in the Old Testament and even New Testament times, a lot of times inheritance was land. I mean, it was the ability to take care of yourself and earn your own income. And then we see stories in the Bible about people who waste that, don't use it well, have to sell themselves into slavery. We had the idea of jubilee. We're not really sure if that was ever truly practiced, but where that would go back to the rightful owners eventually. But at least everybody had the ability to earn an income. And so I started thinking about today. What is that today? What's the equivalent of that today? And I really believe it's education. Um, The ability to earn an income in our society often boils down to being educated and and just the whole idea of education. It doesn't have to always be college education. It could be being a mechanic or learning some other skill, but it certainly is being able to take care of yourself and generate income. So maybe, and as I say in the book, maybe the better way to look at inheritance is to give that inheritance through education or making sure um, your children can be educated. You can't guarantee they'll use it well, they could do the same thing as, as the biblical times people did and kind of waste that. But at least you've given them that opportunity. And so that would free you up when you uh, pass away, if you have a large estate, to be able to sow that into God's kingdom somehow rather than just to give it to your children. And that's what uh, my wife and I have done. We have seven children, um, but each of our children, we have said, we'll probably get something Uh, But not a lot. Most of it's going to be, if we have money left when we die, is going to be given to causes we believe God honors and would like to see supported. I I think why I had such an aha moment is that's that's what my parents did. So they were both Christian school teachers. They didn't have large salaries by any stretch of the means. Um, But essentially they said, you know, mom works so that I can go to college. And Mm -hmm. really her whole salary went to me being able to to go to a college that reinforced beliefs and and then also assisted in getting me a job and a career and and set up well. And my parents said, look, there's not going to be much for you, um, if anything, Mm -hmm. when we pass away. But we will help you get your college degree, and so that was one of those. Okay, my my parents lived this out. They they didn't write a chapter on it, but they they lived that out. So thank you. Uh, it was really neat in the book. You have study questions, study guides, and it, and it seems like you have maybe some ideas of how this book could be used. 
So where are you hoping this book is beyond just a, a reader at home mm-hmm. on their Kindle? Where are you hoping to see this be integrated? Yeah, I, th- I think that the best place, and this has kind of been my target audience all along, was college students. Um, if you can develop this mindset of I'm going to set maximums for my life in the college years when you really are poor. I mean, in the college years, most of the time you owe more money than you're worth. And and that happened to me when I came out of college. I owed money. And I think a reasonable amount of debt is okay for education. Um, if, they, if college students can grab a hold of this before they have a lot of money and are tempted to spend money on things they don't really need, that that could truly change our world. And, and I say that to my students today. I said, if you can grab a hold of this and be generous and realize that you're going to sow your life in generosity instead of just stuff you can have on this earth, that you guys and your generation can truly change the world and reach the world for Christ. Um, my generation, the people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, it doesn't appear we had that vision um, we bought a lot of nice things and had a nice lifestyle. And, and it, in some ways, the college student today has grown up with that and have realized it, it doesn't have a lot of deep meaning. And so college students today, if they can grab a hold of these concepts, I truly believe can change the world. Now, certainly adults will benefit, I think, from reading and being challenged as well. And And maybe even if it just comes down to that inheritance part, or instead of passing along hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to their children, if they'll see that as God providing for for them during their life, and now they can sow into his kingdom upon their death, that, that, that could change their thinking too. Well, I benefited from looking the book over, and I'm excited to dig into it more. Um, Where can folks find the book and then if they wanted to talk to you, where can they find you? Uh, yeah, the, it's it's on Amazon. It's been out there for a while. It's pre-orderable um, at, as of our talking today. And once this podcast airs, um, it may be released. But uh, it's on several other websites as well. I honestly don't know all of them. That's <laughs> up to my publisher, which is BMH Books. But there's also a Facebook page that if you put in the principle of maximums, all one word into Facebook as a search, it should come up and um, there, there'll there be little snippets in there off and on about the book. So that's probably the best place. The other, other one is to email me, yeah. which is my name, roger.stichter at grace.edu. And that's probably the best way to get me. Good. Well, one of the things we like to do on the podcast at the end is ask um, some just rapid fire questions. And so, uh, this just helps us get to know you a little bit more. So, um, here's one we always like to ask if you could have lunch with one person, not named Jesus, um, who would it be? It can be past and present. Yeah. Uh, who would it be and why? Yeah, well, I, actually, I know you say one person. I have to do two. So my my dad died about 13 years ago, and I would love again to sit down with him and pick his brain about some things. And you always miss the people uh, that you admired uh, when they're gone. So that would be one. But the other one probably is Ron Sider, who wrote the book um, the, about rich Christians in an age of hunger. I mean, he he seemed to have a lot of thought processes at a very young age. When he first wrote his book, it's in the fourth or so edition now. And um, so back in the 70s, when he first wrote it, he was already thinking about these things. And I'd I'd love to sit down with him and find out more. Hmm. Good one. Um, Okay, so uh, what's one book that you like to gift to others or recommend to others besides your own? (laughs) Yeah, um, I think maybe the book that challenged me the most uh, is a, a one that's old. It, it's called uh, Money and Power by Jacques Ellul. And I, I talk about it a little bit in my book. But wow, I read his book and I was so challenged by it because he he talked about how um, Jesus warned that the rich will not inherit the kingdom. And then he talks about how in this in the world, if you take the whole world, almost nobody has a savings account. 
And so if you have a savings account, hmm. then compared to the world, you're rich. And wow, that really shocked me and challenged me and made me think a lot. Um, and um, making sure that I don't live by rich tendencies, making sure I live by tendencies more like a child. And I talk about that in my book as well, the rich versus children and those hmm. tendencies. Coolest name of an author I think I've ever heard. Yeah, Jacques, Jacques Lule. Lule. That's, yeah. yeah, I like that one. And he wrote it like in the 40s, but it just sounds like he wrote it yesterday. Huh. So it's very, very good. So outside of uh, job, family responsibilities, what are some what are some things you're into? Could be hobbies, books, whatever. Like what are some things you're into right now? Yeah, I love to bicycle. I actually bicycled across the United States when I was 22, coast to coast with another guy. Um and that was a great experience. And then I raced bicycles for a while. I, I, I was way too old to start. But, and you're <laughs> but a road fun. biker, right? I'm a road biker, yeah. not a mountain biker. Um, so I, I love riding on the road. And, and uh, my wife says I probably bike a little too much sometimes. But it's my exercise, my escape, and, and I love doing that. The other thing I, I really enjoy and I've enjoyed since I was a kid is fishing. I, I like to fish. Uh, I have a boat. It's a cheap one. You know, <laughs> I knew kind of the maximum I wanted to spend on a boat and um, found a used one relatively cheap, only, well, less than $2,000 and, and bought a fit, little fishing boat that I use. So, Do yep. you go around to different lakes or do you I have do. Uh, okay. I go to different lakes, take it up to Michigan. Um, yep. It's, it's just kind of a relaxing thing. Some people hate fishing. They say it's so stressful. You know, you have to catch stuff or it's no fun. But for me, it's, again, a way to be out in nature, to think, to uh, just enjoy God's creation and maybe catch a fish or two. And I can confirm the bike hobby. I say you whizzing past my house every once in a <laughs> yeah, while. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so uh, last question I'd like to ask, uh, what's something that's brought you joy this week? Uh, well, it's graduation besides week. Besides this podcast with yeah, me, of and, course. And but podcast. I mean, besides that. So what has brought you joy um, this week? You know, it's interesting. I, I got a, a note. Every once in a while you get thank you notes from students who um, just write something and, and pick you out and say, I just am so thankful for what you did in my life and what you shared and things. And, and that has happened. And uh, I got another thank you note just today I saw and and those things are, are touching, humbling, um, bring me joy, and and I, I think just help me to realize that God wants me to be here and to be a professor and to teach and uh, that it's making an impact. So that brings me joy. Well, thank you for being on the podcast, and thank you for the impact you've had here at Grace College and Seminary. I have the opportunity to go out and meet with alumni, many of them your alumni. Those accounting grads seem to do well um, in life. And so uh, meet with them, and they they always talk about Dr. Stichter and the impact you had on, on their lives. Um, so there's many more you haven't heard of um, or heard from that you've made a difference with as well. Thanks for this book. I'm, I'm excited about it. I love learning about this kind of stuff, and I hope so many more will check it out and learn from it and then pass it on, and we know it will make a difference. Thanks to everybody for listening to the Grace Story podcast today. Our music was written and produced by Dr. Wally Brath, Assistant Professor of Worship Arts at Grace College. Thanks to our co-producers, Andrew Palladino and Rick Neer. And if you can do us a huge favor and rate or comment on this podcast wherever you retrieved it from, we would be so grateful. And until next time, live your best grace story today.